Well, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for having me here. It's great to be here. It's my first time in Noisebridge, and then immediately being able to give a talk is great. Um, yeah, so the topic um, is post-quantum cryptography. Um, if you wonder what this logo is, that's um, a logo of the university that I work for, and uh, the university used to be a Catholic university, so we still stuck with this logo. Um, let me start my talk by, by two quotes. Um, one quote is from 2012. It's by Mark Katchen, um, who's working at IBM, and he's a researcher in um, quantum computers and actually making, well, turning quantum computers into reality. And in 2012, in February 2012, he said that in the past, people have said, maybe it's 50 years away, it's a dream. Maybe it'll happen sometime. I used to think it was 50. Now I'm thinking like it's 15 or a little more. It's within reach. It's within a lifetime, it's gonna happen. So that was like three and a half years ago. And about half a year ago, oh, sorry, four and a half years ago, um, so about half a year ago, Michelle Simmons from the University of New South Wales in Australia said, um, whether we can control the quantum states and all of that at the fundamental level has now been proven. The big killer is, at what point do we build a processor big enough that's faster than a classical computer? That means moving away from small scale models to integrated processing devices and prototypes. That's the challenge that can be done, we anticipate, within the next decade. I like these two quotes because they kind of tell us that maybe within a decade, or maybe let's say, let's be a bit more conservative, like two decades, um, there will be quantum computers that do cool stuff that we can't do today. And um, I think in particular physicists are really excited about this because they can do all kinds of simulations that they can't do today. Uh, but I'm a cryptographer, so then the question is, like, why would I care about this, right? I mean, aside from the fact that it's just cool if science advances. Um, there's essentially two answers to this. It's slightly oversimplifying the slide, but um, one, slide, uh, one, one answer to this is Grover's algorithm. So Grover in 1996 proposed an algorithm that if you have a big universal quantum computer, can find pre-images of basically any function, like a black box function, in um, square root of n, where n is the size of the domain of a function. So black box function means you need to be able to implement this function as a quantum circuit, but then you can find pre-images. As essentially something where brute force would take O of n, and suddenly we get O of square root n. Uh, why does that matter for crypto? Well, we can apply that to keys. So if you have some symmetric cipher, say AS128, where you have a key that has 128 bits, then right now, more or less the best thing to do to break AS is you just try every possible key. And that takes you, well, two to the 128 tries. If you have a quantum computer, it only takes you two to the 64 tries. Well, two to the 64 operations, where operations are evaluations of the AS function on a quantum computer, and then you need to see how that actually, like how much one evaluation costs, but in principle, it's two to the 64. Or if you have a hash function, um, say with 256 bits of output, and you want to find a pre-image of a hash, then right now, well, the best thing you can do is essentially, well, if you have a good hash function, then you can just try, and then it takes you two to the 256 operation, operations. And then you can go to two to the 128. If you have a like, somewhat smaller hash function, then you get into the areas where this becomes really interesting. So as a consequence for crypto, this means that, well, essentially we have to double our key lengths. And, well, depending on what hash functions we're using and depending on what properties of hash functions exactly we need, we might also want to double the hash lengths. And that's something, I mean, from a deployment point of view, that's not so easy to do. If you want to know how hard it is to get rid of a hash function, you can ask Microsoft how hard it was to get rid of MD5, right? Um, so the flame attack, for example, exploited that they were still using MD5, although they shouldn't have. So it's not easy, but at least you know, for an academic, that's something we know how to do. You just use AES-256 and you're good. The second answer to the question why cryptographers care is a bit more threatening. And that's Shaw's algorithm. That was actually proposed two years earlier. Sometimes you find 1997. So there's uh, two versions of that paper, one journal publication, one conference publication. The journal was three years later. But originally it was proposed in 1994. And that does essentially two things. It's, it's way less general than Grover's algorithm. It doesn't have this nice black box property where you just throw in anything and it does something. It does exactly two things. And these, those two things were advertised already in the title of the paper. And that is it factors integers in polynomial time on a quantum computer, and it computes discrete logarithms in polynomial time on a quantum computer. Now, what are the consequences of that algorithm? Well, RSA is dead, Elgamal is dead, 
DSA is dead, Diffie-Hellman is dead, all the elliptic curve variants of it is all dead. So basically all of the public key crypto we're using every single day today, it will all be broken. And that's really why quantum computers are so interesting for cryptographers because everything we've been building up over the last few decades will essentially be gone once, like, say, the NSA has a quantum computer. Now then, the obvious question is, is public key cryptography dead? Because that would be really bad. Uh, luckily, well, then also my talk would be over at this point. Um, luckily, that's not the case. So there's something, there's schemes that, as far as we know, they're not affected by quantum computers, or at least not as badly affected by quantum computers. Um, probably the most conservative construction are hash-based signatures. Um, two examples are XMSS, that's a scheme that is currently being um, in the process of being standardized. Um, another proposal is, is Sphinx, and I had to mention Sphinx because I'm wearing this Eliminate the States t-shirt today, which has the, it's, it's from the Sphinx project, something we proposed last year at Eurocrypt um, in, um, um, well, at Eurocrypt 2015. Um, this is really conservative, but also, well, it's, it's only signatures. Then there's code-based cryptography, and the most prominent representative is the Mechalese crypto system, which is already quite old. I think it's from 85. So it's already around for a pretty long time, and quite a few people have looked at it. It feels like a reasonably conservative choice. Um, and that one does encryption, which is, which is cool. So we have encryption, we have signatures. Sounds already pretty good. Um, there's other options. There's multivariate signatures, for example. And so they're based on the, on the hardness. If you get a, a system of equations in many, many variables, and that's not um, linear equations, but that's like quadratic equations, for example, then those systems are hard to solve. So that's the underlying hard problem of that one. And this seems like unbalanced oil and vinegar, so UOV, or um, hidden field equations and variants of it, so most prominently H of EV minus. Then there's lattice-based crypto, and that's something that I will look at a bit more closely um, later in the talk. Um, most prominently ENTRU and LWE encryption and key exchange, what we're going to do later. And then there's something which quite often misses in the list of post-quantum crypto, and that is super singular isogeny crypto, um, and in particular the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. That's something that's proposed somewhat more recently, I think 2011 originally, and that's now getting a bit of traction, um, and that might actually also be a really interesting um, option once it's a bit better understood, a bit better analyzed. So you might wonder, I mean, if we have that good signature sitting around, we have pretty conservative encryption sitting around. Um, why aren't we just using those today and then everything is good and we don't have to worry about quantum computers anymore? Well, the first obvious answer is it's too slow, right? So my um, PhD thesis was on high-speed crypto where basically you just try to make everything like super fast. And then if you have slow schemes, that kind of sucks. So um, if it's slow, then that would be a problem, but it's actually not even true. It's, it's true for some of those. So for example, SIDH at the moment is quite a bit slower than elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, like a factor of more than 100 slower. But ENTRU, for example, is reasonably fast. LWE encryption is fast. Macalese is fast. XMSS is fast. It's not a problem. Um, multivariate signatures, they're also fast. Second problem is somewhat more critical. Um, we get larger. So we get larger keys, we get larger signatures, and we get larger ciphertexts. And that is actually in the ballpark where we don't only need a few bytes, but we need a few kilobytes, or maybe in some schemes even up to like a few megabytes of key. Which, if you imagine that for public keys, that can very easily get annoying, in particular when you need to transmit them very often. It's also not true for all of them, but for some. Then for some of them, actually, we don't understand how secure they are. So elliptic curve cryptography is now around since the 80s. Quite a few people have looked at it. A few curves have been shown to be vulnerable, but the conservative choice is basically the best attacks, they're still as good as in the 80s. And no one has come up with anything, although many, many people have tried. Um, here it's much less understood how good attacks are in practice, how they scale, um, at which point asymptotically better attacks take over. So that's much, yeah, much less conservative. And then finally, Sometimes you have additional issues, and that's particularly the case for hash-based signing. So the most conservative, the best understood solution um, has this issue that the really efficient schemes, they're stateful. So every time you sign, you need to update your secret key. And if you don't do that, or if you reuse an old state, then it becomes insecure. 
Now imagine how that interacts with backups, where you back up your keys and then at some point you restore and then you reuse the key, then you're screwed. That's, in some contexts that works very well, if you put it on a smart card where the key never leaves the smart card, you don't need a backup, that's, that's maybe just fine. But in many contexts that just doesn't work very well. Okay, so there's a bit of a problem. It's like we kind of need post-quantum crypto, at least like in 20 years, maybe 10. Um, and the ones that we have, there's some candidates, but we, we're not really confident in using them. So what do we do? Well, NIST recognized that, and NIST said, you know, let's have sort of a competition here. And they issued a call, it's at the moment in draft status online, um, and they said we want to have post-quantum signatures, we want to have post-quantum encryption, and we want to have post-quantum key agreement. And now, please, researchers, just go. Right? Come up with proposals and submit something. And they say the submission deadline is November 2017. That was fixed a few days ago. And then submitters should present early 2018 at a workshop. And then there will be an analysis of three to five years. And then they would take another two years to come up with draft standards of post-quantum crypto. And then hopefully we have something that everybody's happy with and everybody can use. Uh, there's um, a link to, to the website. If you like to submit something, take a look at it. That's great for us because um, like one and a half years ago, we started with a research project on exactly this topic. It's funded by the European Union, so the European Union also noticed that, um, well, this is an issue, so we need to throw money at researchers, and they need to get stuff done. So um, we have 11 partners working on this, and the goal of this is actually not just designing stuff, but designing and implementing high security post-quantum crypto, so exactly what seems to be needed. It's great. It's exactly the situation that you want to be in if you're an academic like me. There is some public interest, like NIST pushing, right? There's all kind of international research groups working on this, so you can travel around the world and work with cool people. There is funding, so you can actually pay for this travel. And you're good. You're good for a few years. And then occasionally, as an academic, you leave your ivory tower, and you realize that the real world really sucks. Um, for example, like this. So if you look at that, uh, probably most people here know the picture. It's the NSA data center in Bluffdale. Um, I tried to look up a few numbers of that one. It, you only get estimates um, of uh, 65 megawatts electricity consumption per year, an energy bill of like $40 million per year. And the scary thing is a storage of three to 12 exabytes. So really huge storage facilities. Why is that scary? Well, imagine that the NSA is sitting there and is now recording traffic from the internet, encrypted traffic, pre-quantum secure, say RSA encrypted, Diffie-Hellman key exchanges, stuff like that. And it's just storing this on these huge hard drives. And then in 15 years, when they have a quantum computer, they just go back and decrypt all of this. Now there's some communication where really I don't care anymore in 15 years, right? I mean, honestly. But there's quite a bit of communication of quite a few people. They actually will still care in 15 years. And while we don't know what the world will look like in 15 years, maybe we're not living in a, in a very comfortable state anymore where you, know, you feel like you know, my, my chat from like 15 years ago doesn't matter anymore. It was not really that serious after all. Um, so that is actually a real threat. And what does that mean? Well, really, we want post-quantum encryption now. Well, actually, we might have wanted post-quantum encryption 15 years ago, but we can't undo this anymore. So well, we better do something, well, as soon as possible. Now, at this point, when you're, when you're entering a discussion, then sometimes what you hear um, is, well, but we have perfect forward secrecy, right? Um, so the idea of perfect forward secrecy is the following. You have your long-term keys sitting around, your long-term, well, public and private key pairs, and you never use your long-term keys for encryption. Because that would mean that if you get compromised, if your laptop, for example, gets compromised, somebody gets the keys, they can just go back and decrypt everything that you encrypted with those keys. So the idea is to use um, the long-term keys only for authentication so that people know that they're actually talking with you. And then you have short-term ephemeral keys that you immediately throw away after the communication has happened. Now, if somebody compromises your, uh, your long-term keys, then after that, they, after that point in time, they can, they can impersonate you, but they can't go back and encrypt what they recorded before. Now, does that help against quantum computers breaking into crypto? No, it doesn't. The problem is, this helps only against somebody compromising your key. It doesn't help against somebody breaking into your crypto because they have like the public um, records of what went over the channel and if you can break it through that, you never ever need the key. So 
well, you increase it because there's a little bit like more keys to be broken, but if you can break them in polynomial time, that's not a real, real help. So we still care. And as a consequence, well, we, we, we do want ephemeral key exchange because maybe at least in the next few years, uh, key compromise is in practice a more serious problem than quantum computers. Uh, but then also because, well, we don't know what happens in 15 or 20 years, we kind of want post-quantum security now. So what we want is post-quantum ephemeral key exchange. And that's something that I'm gonna talk about, well, basically in the rest of my talk. Um, that's a project that um, I did together with Erdem Alkim and Leo Duca and Thomas Pöppelmann. And the title of the paper is Post-Quantum Key Exchange in New Hope. There's a bit of a reason for this. Um, I will show later that we started from research uh, by um, Boss, Costello, Nerik, and Stibila. And Nerik, Michael Nerik, is a very good friend of mine. And maybe some of you have seen my Twitter handle at CryptoJedi. And some of you maybe have seen my website, which is CryptoJedi.org. Michael is the crypto Sith. Um, we started the website together, CryptoJedi.org, and then he went to Microsoft Research. And then he got to, to the dark side, and he got that handle. And so we kind of had to tease him after improving the results, and that's why we chose this paper title. OK, now on the next few slides, like two or three slides, it's going to be a little bit mathy. Um, but you know, if you get lost there, we'll try to give you the main ideas. And then like, for those of you who are not that mathy, um, and if you can't follow, then I hope you can still follow afterwards. Um, so I will need a little bit of notation. And the, uh, the core problem that this key exchange is being based on, that's ring LWE, or RLWE, or ring learning with errors. And the mathematical structure that we're working with most of the time is this one. So this is a polynomial ring. So essentially, when well, you take polynomials, in the variable x, where all coefficients are integers modulo q. So in other words, you can think of this as integers between 0 and q minus 1. And those polynomials all have um, n coefficients. And in order to make sure that they well, stay in this like, n coefficient thing, after we multiply two polynomials, they get larger. Then we reduce them. And we reduce them modulo x to the n plus 1. So basically, you do a polynomial division and take the remainder. Then we will need an error distribution. So you can think of this as, well, you sample some polynomials that have small coefficients. So basically, you add some noise later. So that's this, this chi here that's coming in. And then we can already pretty much define what the ring learning with errors problem is. We take some s in this ring, in this polynomial ring, which is a secret. And then the attacker is given pairs a and as plus e, where a is uniformly random. And this E is sort of the noise that we are adding to it, um, which is sampled according to this noise distribution. So if you didn't have the noise, then you could just use linear algebra to solve this problem. But the noise really makes it hard. Um, yeah, so task for the attacker, find S. There's um, a very common choice for this noise distribution. That's a discrete Gaussian distribution. I'm not going to go into detail with, uh, of this. I will mention later a little bit of a problem, or a little bit of why we decided not to choose this. Um, so I don't have to explain what this really is because we're not using it. There's a second optimization for this, and that is that you just fix A. So you just say for, for all users, A is just a system parameter. You just compile it into the software. Everybody's using the same A. I will come back to this later because we also decided not to do that. That's some good reason for not, to do, not doing this. OK. Hey, hey Peter, I have a question. <coughs> yeah. Is is uniformly random, or is it drawn from Kai? Um, well, we sample it from Kai, yeah. and most people do. OK, so a bit of history, and that's like totally not an exhaustive history. There's tons of papers on, on learning with errors, and on ring learning with errors, and crypto systems based on that. But this is a little bit of the history that led to where we were going. So in 2005, Regev introduced learning with errors, so without this ring learning with errors. And that essentially means that this, this A is not a polynomial, but it becomes a big matrix, which is a bit annoying, possibly, um, because you have to work with, well, possibly big public keys, and you don't want that. And then in 2010, Libyshevsky, Pikett, and Regev came up with this ring LWE, which made the whole thing much more efficient. But you can think of this as you take this huge matrix, and suddenly you introduce structure to it. And the structure allows you to compress this matrix to, well, essentially then a polynomial. And Usually cryptographers, when you add structure, they feel like, yeah, that doesn't feel good. 
I mean, maybe an attacker can exploit that structure. And it's actually a very interesting problem that I think more people should be working on over the next few years to understand how and, well, whether and how this structure can be exploited. It's something that is asymptotically, you can make some statements about this, and there's asymptotic statements about this. But really concrete statements, whether, like, how hard these problems are for concrete parameters, that's not really well understood. Um, so they also wrote down the ring LWE encryption. And then 2012, uh, Ding Xie and Lin transformed that to a key exchange, which is similar to the encryption. There's a bit of a tweak in the second message that you send. You can, you can tweak that a bit. Then in 2014, PyCurt improved that one. And that paper, I think, was called Lattice-Based Cryptography for the Internet. And it, it's a pretty cool paper. The interesting thing is that it doesn't propose any concrete parameters that you could implement. Which is funny when you call a paper for the internet because if you like, this sounds like I can implement, I can sit down and implement that for TLS. You can't really do that. But then there was a bit of this gap that was filled in 2015 by uh, Bas Costello, Nerik, and Stibila, the, uh, well, crypto Sith, well, here, the Michel, Michel Nerik. And they chose parameters for this scheme and then they implemented it and they integrated it into TLS. I'm coming back to that in a bit. Okay, so. The important two things here is this paper here and this one, because that's, well, where we said, okay, let's start off from there and see whether we can do better. So here is the scheme by PyCurt. Um, the laptop is doing weird things, but I guess that's okay. Um, so what it's doing here, it is first um, taking a system parameter A. So that's this idea that you just fix the A for all times, compile it into your software. And then you take that as an input and you generate a key. And the key means you're just sampling S and E from this noise distribution. And then you compute B, which is AS plus E. So that's exactly what we saw before. Um, you compute A times S plus this error, and then, well, that's given to the attacker, and the attacker is supposed to find out S. And we sent that over to the other side. The other side, in the meantime, has also sampled some values, S prime, E prime, and E double prime, also according to this noise distribution, and um, computes a s prime plus e prime, so that's essentially the same computation as here, um, computes b s prime plus e double prime, and then does some, some fun stuff here. So that's a randomized doubling that we don't really need to zoom into. Um, and then sends over u. So the u here is essentially the same as the b. And then the two sides compute a value which is almost the same. So on this side, you get this v bar, which is roughly 2 a a s prime, a s s prime, plus, well, this noise term here. And on this side, what you get is the 2us, and that's the 2ass prime plus, well, some other noise term here. And, well, we can assume that those noise terms are small. So both sides get something which is almost the same, but not exactly the same. And that is a bit of a problem because we need to agree on an actual key that should better be precise. So that's why um, Bob sends over a little bit of additional information, this v prime, and this v prime with very high probability allows both parties to agree on the same thing. And um, we will see later how this is done in New Hope. Um, then we don't need to zoom into the details here. So that was essentially was PyCut, what PyCut proposed. And then um, at IEEE SNP in 2015, uh, Boss, Costello, and Eric and Stibina, they came up with this idea that they say, OK, we used it as a key exchange. So originally it was phrased as a key encapsulation mechanism, but that's essentially the same. They gave concrete parameters, namely those. Um, they implemented this, integrated into OpenSSL, and they showed that in OpenSSL, you can do post-quantum key exchange with this approach. They also came up with a combination of um, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and this ring LWE-based key exchange. And, um, well, this is the parameters they chose. So this is the ring. I showed this before, this polynomial ring, uh, where n is 1024. So now we have polynomials with 1024 coefficients that we're working with. And each coefficient here is taken modulo 2 to the 32 minus 1. So we have essentially 32-bit integers. Well, not quite in the modular sense, but they can be represented as 32-bit integers. Then they take a discrete Gaussian distribution here with a standard deviation of 3.192. Don't need to understand the details of that. Um, that's what they chose. And that's what they got out of it. So they got a security level of 128 bits. That's what the paper claimed pre-quantum. So they said, we give you post-quantum cryptography, but we give you a security level of this only if an attacker may not attack that with a quantum computer. 
Which is a bit like, this feels like not exactly what we want to have. Also, they had a failure probability. So this scheme, well, typically, has a certain failure probability. The idea is that, if you look at the previous slide, there are these noise terms. Now, if you make the noise really, really large, then the two sides get something completely different, and then even this bit of information you send over here doesn't help the two sides to agree on the same key. Now, if you make the noise smaller and smaller, then the security goes down. I mean, you can imagine if the noise is zero, then you just break it with linear algebra. So this is a trade-off between the security, which you get with larger noise, and, well, failure probability, which, well, you decrease by choosing smaller noise. And they went for a really, really low failure probability. So this is the failure probability of will really, really, really never happen. OK. So um, last year in June, um, I was at a summer school in Croatia. By the way, great summer school. They're going to have that again next year. If somebody feels like going to a really nice beach resort and learn about crypto, that's a great place to go. It's going to be the second week of June next year. Um, so I was there, and um, Thomas was there, Adam was there, Leo was there. And at some point, Thomas, over a beer, talks to me and said, hey, Peter, have you seen this paper by the Microsoft guys? I was like, yeah, but took a quick look at it. Why? He said, we can do better than that. I said, okay. He said, you know, we can actually do much better than that. I said, okay. And Thomas wrote his whole PhD thesis on lattice implementations. And so he really knows the stuff, right? He has a good intuition for how you choose parameters and how you make things fast. And he was like, we can make this 100 times faster. I mean, literally 100 times faster. You know, Thomas, if, if you think we can do that, we should do that. And then, well, Adam was also sitting there. Leo also joined. And I said, you know, guys, you know, that sounds like a cool thing to do. How about I just invite you over to Nijmegen, and we have like a, a few days of research and some good beers, which we actually happen to have in the Netherlands, and we just see where we go with this. So that's what we did. They came over for a few days, and we did some scribbling on whiteboards. We threw back and forth some ideas. And then after two days, we came up with so sort of the first sketch of what we believed at the time, and well, still believe now, is quite a bit better. Um, and one thing that we did for this is that we said, okay, this, we need to really understand this failure probability. Because if we can really understand how likely this is to fail, then we can choose the security parameter to really get extremely close to where we want to get. And we want to have a failure probability of 2 to the minus 60. Actually, an earlier version that we like, wrote down at first had something like 2 to the minus 100 or 2 to the minus 105. And then early this year, I was at uh, Real World Crypto in Stanford. And I talked to Adam Langley from Google. And, and Adam was like, you know what? I'm like, why? I said, what do you mean, why? He said, you know, 2 to the minus 60 is just fine. We don't care. If something fails with probability 2 to the minus 60, that's never going to happen. I mean, there's so many other failures that happen much. We don't care. So that's good that you tell us. Then we can make it more secure. So OK, we ended up with 2 to the minus 60 after the discussion with Adam. And um, we actually drastically reduced Q. So remember this Q that the BCNS proposal had that was 32 bits. And we went down to 14 bits. Now, typically in crypto, when you make things smaller, they become less secure. And the cool thing is, in lattice-based crypto, with the Q, it's exactly the opposite. And the intuition here is the following. You want the noise to matter for security. Now, the noise matters relative to the whole size of the coefficients. If the coefficient is huge and you have a tiny noise, then the noise doesn't matter. If you make the coefficient smaller, then even small noise starts to matter. So reducing the size of the Q actually increases security. So we chose that to be a slightly smaller than 2 to the 14. Um, this is with N, it's still the traditional sort of intuition of crypto, where if you increase N, it's becoming more secure. So we decided, let's stick to the 1024. And I will come back later to why we did this. Then we said, you know, we really want to know what an attacker can do throwing a quantum computer at this. So let's analyze um, the post-quantum security of this key exchange scheme. And then we looked at the noise distribution. And we had quite some discussion over this on the week. So um, Leo, basically, he, he looks at this from a very nice mathematical perspective. And in many, many aspects, I have to totally trust him, because he understands the lattice math. I don't. Um, for the noise, I just told him, you know, Leo, Gaussian noise is really annoying. The problem is, if you want to sample Gaussian noise at the quality that you need for this to be secure, um, you end up with something that is either insecure or inefficient. And the problem is that all algorithms doing this really efficiently, they use either some conditional branches in there, 
which uh, enable timing attacks. And then, well, you, you basically measure how long the key exchange takes, and then you learn something about the noise, which is disastrous, potentially. Um, other options use lookup tables, which, again, introduce timing leaks, and again, you're screwed. So I said, you know, do we really need Gaussian noise there? He said, no, we don't. Not for encryption. For signatures, yeah, probably, maybe. But not for encryption. For encryption, we're fine. We need something that looks kind of Gaussian. Something like, you know, the, the Gaussian curve. So let's just add up a few bits here, and let's add up a few bits there, and then just subtract the two values, and we're good. So that's this distribution here, where you basically take, uh, well, k equals 16 later. So you just add up 16 bits, you add up another 16 bits, you subtract the two values, and you're done. And that gives pretty decent Gaussian-like looking noise, which is just fine here. Um, then we decided that we dropped this optimization of choosing a fixed system parameter A. And I'll come back to why we're doing this. And that's actually a major change. Um, then when we send polynomials, we first uh, uh, send them to an NTT. For those of you who know what an FFT is, that's essentially the same, just in a discrete structure in a finite field, which we have here. And again, I will say a bit more about this later. And then we wrote some software and uh, put out a C implementation, an optimized assembly implementation, and just realized that it's quite a bit faster. And again, I'm going to show a bit more about this later. Let's first take a look at the protocol. The protocol looks very much like the previous one. So again, um, we're sampling this S and E. We compute B is equals A S plus B. Same happens here with U and V. There's a few different things. So one different thing is that we are generating the system parameter every single time a fresh one on the side of Alice. And we generate that from a seed, a 32-byte seed, by sending that through shake. Um, shake is this uh, one function which has been standardized in FIPS 202. It's essentially a hash function with an arbitrarily long output. And then we just pass that output into a polynomial. Pretty straightforward procedure. Do the same, we send the seed over so that on the other side we can generate the same A. We obviously need that. Um, and then instead of this weird doubling function, this randomized doubling, we have a help rec function here, which computes this R. And we have a, a rec function which on both sides, once from V prime and once from V, um, computes a final key, final key. And then we hash this final key once. And that's part of the protocol. And that gets us several nice security properties. So essentially the same as before, except for, well, this parsing here and different help rack and rack. Let's take a look at this help rack and rack. So what we get is that Alice um, is running the protocol and afterwards has this value sitting around, this A S S prime plus E prime S. And Bob has this value, A S S prime plus E S prime plus E double prime. And as I said, those are noise terms here. They're relatively small, but still you get slightly different values. Now, if you have values and you know that you're kind of similar, but you, um, well, you also know that there's a bit of noise involved, if you don't communicate any more information, you can't agree on, like, guaranteed to, guarantee, to, to agree on the same value. Basically, you can draw a line somewhere, but then there will always be the case where one person's on one side of the line and the other person's on the other side of the line. And then you can make an environment where you say, okay, well, we know that there's this danger zone around, the, around this line, so then you say, well, let's just ignore this danger zone and then just drop all those bits. But then the problem is that one person doesn't know whether it's in the danger zone or not, and then you expand the danger zone until basically everything becomes danger zone. Um, you can think about this as a fun exercise. You can draw pictures with this. I've done this for quite a few hours in this until I was convinced that what Leo told me is true. Um, so how do we agree on a joint value from sort of noisy stuff? There's multiple approaches to doing this. And um, the lattice signature uh, li literature um, has various approaches how to do to extract one bit from each coefficient. So you have like this 1024 bit or 1024 coefficient polynomial, and you extract one bit from each of the coefficients. That's no. You can also extract multiple bits from each of the coefficients. That basically means that you need to lower the noise and lower the security. And we didn't want that, because we want a key exchange. And a key that we need in the end will be a 256-bit key. That's just fine. Also, post-quantum, that's just fine. So what we wanted was we wanted to extract one bit from multiple coefficients and increase security. And that's what, well, it had been done before for two coefficients in a very straightforward manner. And we generalized this. And I'll try to explain in the next few slides how that works. 
So specifically, we want to get, we have four coefficients and we want to extract one bit from them. And these coefficients are a bit noisy. Um, in the following, I will do this not with four coefficients, but with two coefficients, because we need a four dimensional thing for this. And four dimensional things don't fit very well on slides. Um, the two dimensional intuition is actually pretty, pretty nice. And then if you do this in four dimensions mathematically, that actually not very much changes. Okay, so we have this vector here, this x, which is noisy. And we first scale that, because that makes mathematicians happy, to um, 0, 1. So basically, we just divide everything by q. Like every single co coefficient in there, we divide by q. And then we get something like this. So we get an, uh, some, some vector, some point, which is in this dashed square. And then we draw, in here, we draw a lattice that these, that's these points here with their Voronoi cells. So essentially that's this white cube, these white cubes and the gray cube. And now what we simply say is, well, if x is in the gray cube, then we say we pick a bit which is 1. And if x is in the white uh, cube here, or white square, sorry, then um, we say the bit is 0. But so far that's easy. And if we actually had the same x on both sides, that would just work. But we don't. So what happens if one side has like something which is sitting here, and the other side has something which is sitting here. We need to kind of fix this issue. And we do this by saying Bob is sending the difference vector between his point and the center of the Voronoi cell. So for example, if Bob has got a point sitting here, then he's sending this vector going to the center. And what Alice does then is adding this vector and basically moving her point towards the center of the Voronoi cell and into the Voronoi cell where Bob is sitting. That's the general idea of the, of the reconciliation. Now, if we do this, that just works. The problem is that um, on the, the reconciliation information that we're sending, so this difference vector, means we're sending a full element of the, of the field again. So that would make our message twice as, as big. And we want to avoid that. So we do this by uh, discretization. So just say, let's just look at the, at the gray Voronoi cell, and we just chop it into smaller pieces. And then we only send information, I'm sitting in this piece. And then we're just using the difference vector from the center of this small, um, the small square here to the center of this Voronoi cell. And then that just works. So you can chop this into um, dr subcells where uh, d is the dimension. So here that's 2. Uh, for New Hope, that's 4. And um, then we just say we need a certain discretization level. And that's, well, r in this case is also 2. And you hope also uses r equals 2. So in the end, we need to send um, two bits of reconciliation information per coefficient, um, or uh, well, 8 per 4 coefficients. And that means that we get a total of 2,048 bits of reconciliation information, or 256 bytes of reconciliation information. So we send that over, and then we're good. And then, of course, you need to play still with the noise distribution to make sure that you're not too far away. But, well, this plays out, and you can just tweak this, and uh, then that works. There's still one problem left. And so that would just work just fine. It would also be totally secure if the vectors that we got were actually continuous and like across this whole big dashed square. But we started with discrete information. So, in total, we have x, which is in, well, in the two-dimensional case here, we get originally, we start from 0 to q minus 1. And we square that because we got two components because it's two-dimensional. But that is definitely an odd value. So q is odd. And then q squared is still odd. And I can tell you in the four-dimensional case, q to the 4 is also still odd. Now, if you distribute that onto zeros and ones, you will get a bias. So either you get more, like, zero slightly more likely or one slightly more likely. And possibly a problem, it's actually nasty to analyze. I mean, you could say, you know, if the bias is really, really small and we run a hash at the very end, then, well, probably everything is fine. But then you need to analyze whether an attacker looking at this biased information being sent over the network can learn possibly something. And it becomes a little bit of a nasty analysis. And we said, no, OK, let's not do this. Let's just generalize what uh, Pikert already did in his 2014 paper. And the idea is to blur the edges. So essentially what we're doing is, before we're computing this reconciliation vector, we are just adding with a, very, uh, with a probability of 1 half, we're adding the vector 1 divided by 2q, 1 divided by 2q. And on the next slide, I have a picture showing what that does. 
and that will eliminate this bias. Here's why. So this is a case for q equals 9, because this is something you can draw. Um, you see that you have um, so 81 possible values. 41 are red, and 40 are black. That's exactly the bias. Now you add to each of those, with probability 1 half, these vectors. So this one here, for example, with probability 1 half, before doing the reconciliation, moves here. That doesn't matter. It stays in the same Voronoi cell. This only matters for these points here that move to the other Voronoi cell. So these five black ones and those four red ones up here. So in other words, those nine points, the four red ones and the, um, and the five black ones, they, well, with probability one half, they live in the, in the white Voronoi cell. And with probability one half, they live in the gray one. And that eliminates the bias. So basically, those well, have a certain chance of being in, in either. Now, this picture looks like this is adding quite a bit of additional noise. But this 1 divided by 2q becomes completely negligible when q becomes larger. So, but then you can't really draw it anymore. OK, so reconciliation fixed. You can just implement that um, if you don't map everything to, uh, to this uh, like unit square. Then everything is integer arithmetic. It's all very, or if you, want, you can make a fixed point arithmetic. That's all very, very nice. OK, now if you do that, then the question is, of course, we said we wanted, wanted this to be secure. Uh, in a post-quantum world. So how secure is this? And this is the slide where if you ask me questions later, then I probably have to just tell you, you know what, ask Leo. Because this is really, this is Leo's world. He understands this. So the idea is that the best attack against this kind of system, as far as we understand, is to treat this ring LWE instance as an LWE instance. At least no one really knows how to exploit this additional structure in this matrix that I was mentioning before. And if you want a really cool research topic, this, is, this would be great if more people looked at it. But if you assume that you can't exploit the structure, then you attack LWE. And you do this by using an algorithm called BKZ. And BKZ, what it does is it does, it's doing various um, queries to a so-called SVP oracle, so shortest vector problem oracle. Uh, so you solve a so-called shortest vector problem in a smaller lattice, and well, you do that repeatedly. How often? Well, it's polynomial, but you don't really know how often. It's, uh, you can debate about this. We just said, let's ignore how often. Let's just say you do that once. Everything else you give for the attacker for free. And we just say, OK, so let's say that's the core SVP hardness of the whole thing. And it's giving the attacker actually quite a bit for free. And then we said, let's look at the best, asymptotically best algorithm um, for this SVP oracle. And there's also debates about which, whether this algorithm is actually the best one, because it needs a whole bunch of memory. And the question is, you know, if you actually implement this, wouldn't other algorithms be better? We just say access to memory costs O of 1. We take the RAM model. We ignore that there's all this memory sitting around. We give this to the attacker for free and just say, that's your asymptotic cost. Let's just see where you get. And then the best known quantum cost that a quantum attacker can do with this quantum sieve is this 2 to the 0.256m. But then you can tweak this a bit, and you can look at maybe actually this quantum sieve gets better because people are doing research on that. And then we came up with this notion of the best plausible cost. The best plausible cost comes from the idea that the sieving algorithm first needs a certain amount of input. And the certain amount of input you get classically. There's no quantum computer involved. And that's the amount of input that you need before you even start anything classic, uh, quantum in, the, in these algorithms. So that's the best plausible quantum cost. And we wanted this to be secure against this most best plausible quantum cost with this algorithm. And then there's two different styles of attacks. There's a primal attack. I won't go in detail into this. And a dual attack. And um, well, now you can look at the complexities of this, and you could get cool numbers. And that's what we did in the first version of the paper. And we submitted this, um, and it got rejected. Now. You know, when paper gets rejected, you get comments from reviewers, and typically, you know, there's some valid criticism. You improve the paper, everything is good. Sometimes you get criticism which is not particularly justified, and then you're annoyed. But this time, we got a comment from a reviewer that completely puzzled me. And usually, I don't show reviewers' comments, but I have to show this one, because this was the only motivation for us to, for a certain addition in the paper. This was the reviewer comment. The reviewer said, I don't like the way that the parameters are set. I think that setting them too high impedes research. So essentially, the reviewer said, that's too secure. We were like, OK, 
So we're proposing a crypto scheme that, spoiler alert, uh, takes messages that are half the size, which is um, much, much more secure than anything before, is 20 times faster, and we get criticized because it's too secure. That's interesting. So after we got this comment, we decided that we're not submitting this paper anymore to a crypto conference, but to a security conference, where it is accepted now. It's nice. Um, so I'm going to present this next, uh, next week in, uh, yeah, next week in Austin at Usenet Security. Um, yeah. So what do you do with this comment, right? I mean, if somebody says you, need, you should have like low security stuff, sit down and say, yeah, yeah, of course we can do that. Right? We, can, we can write down something which is less secure. But it feels bad. So we were discussing, said, you know, if we do this, I really don't want people to use this. So how do we make sure that people don't use this? I said, well, first of all, we don't put the software online. I, had, I don't put software online that I don't want people to use. OK, yeah. And said, but we should also find a name for it. And then ISIS just told us, you know what? If you call it Jar Jar, nobody, nobody's ever going to use this. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, that sounds like a good solution to the problem. So here's Jar Jar. Um, so Jar Jar, we decided to choose n equals 512. Um, and then we choose the same queue. You will understand later why. Um, in that case, you also want a 256-bit key, so you need to extract um, 256 bits from 512 coefficients, so you get exactly this two-dimensional thing that I showed earlier. And then we chose a slightly different k for the centered binomial distribution, 24 instead of 16. OK. Um, the name has already paid off. At some point, somebody in the Tor mailing list said, you know what, maybe for Tor, Jar Jar is just fine. I mean, you know, messages are only half the size. And I could just answer one sentence saying, there is a reason that it's called Jar Jar. And the discussion was over. It was just really good. Um, so I think I have emphasized this enough by now, right? You, you don't use that. Um, so here's security analysis. So we threw this um, really conservative security analysis, giving all kind of shit to the attacker for free. We just threw this at different proposals. So in particular, the BCNS proposal, and then Jar Jar, and then Neuro. So um, what we got is that the best known classical algorithm, you get uh, 86 bits of security. Now, you might wonder, wait a second, didn't that paper say that we get 128 bits of security? Yeah, they did. Um, that's essentially what we give the attacker for free, where we said we don't want any discussions about what the real cost is, and there is some actual real cost involved. Let's not discuss that, give it to the attacker for free. So, Saying that this is 86 here doesn't mean that you can actually attack this in 86, just that there's really no way that you can do better with anything that anyone knows who is publishing stuff. Um, now for Jar Jar, what we get is uh, classical, so not quantum. We get 131 bits of security, which feels like not so bad. And quantum, we get something like slightly below 120. And if you look at these numbers, then you can understand why people say, you know, 128 bits of security, that's not so bad after all. The thing is, I would really bet quite some money that lattice attacks get better over the next few years. And if people are using it now in the context that I advertised at the beginning, saying that we want to be secure against attacks in maybe 30 years, then I really want to have a conservative security gap in there. And we can afford it. New Hope is fast. You will see that in a bit. So what we get for New Hope is these numbers. So even um, the best plausible quantum attack is around 200 bits of security. <coughs> so even if attacks get much better, and the, the largest threat I see by people exploiting this structure that we have polynomials instead of matrices, like completely unstructured matrices. So if that gets exploited and even halves the security, then we would still be fine in, in the best attacks that are known today with everything we give the attacker for free. So that gives me a somewhat, somewhat comfortable feeling there. Okay. There is um, actually more to why we believe that New Hope is maybe a good conservative proposal. And um, there's this feature that I mentioned earlier that we're not taking A as a fixed system parameter. And the paper we call this Against All Authority. Uh, it's a bit of a reference. Some people here may understand this. Um, so if you have a fixed A that is compiled into all software, then at some point somebody will come up with a question saying, um, what if A is backdoored? So how do you choose this A in the first place? Um, cryptographers will say, uh, tell you, um, oh, it has to be uniformly random. Where do you get uniformly random stuff from that everybody trusts afterwards? It's not so easy. There is this nothing up my sleeves construction where you choose um, a seed and then you hash stuff and then you expand this maybe through some RNG 
and then you end up in endless discussions about uh, which RNG and which hash, and you can have just cryptographers discuss forever about this. Now, assume that you get cryptographers to agree on something. It's a hard task, but let's assume you can do that. There's still a problem, and that's the problem that should lattice-based crypto really see huge improvements in cryptanalysis? Then if you have a fixed A, you can imagine an attacker doing the following. You do a massive computation which is only based on this fixed A. So let's say it's not like completely broken like that you can do every key exchange just in a few seconds break it. But let's say you need to compute a year to break one. Now if you have a fixed A, you do this computation once based on A, and then afterwards you can just break every single key exchange in a few seconds. And that's kind of scary. That's exactly the kind of attack that how Logjam worked and how the Logjam papers speculated that quite a bit of uh, Diffie-Hellman um, key exchanges in TLS are being broken by the NSA. So we really didn't want this. So we said, well, let's get rid of it and just choose a fresh A every single time. And then if you have an attack which needs a year to compute, you need one year for every single key exchange, which, you know, you may do for a few of them, but not for that many. Um, yeah, then as I said, we're using Shake128 to expand this 32-byte feed. Um, the server can actually cache this A for some time. I mean, if you use A for like an hour, then you would say an attacker still needs to break, like, um, do this one-year computation for every single hour that the server was running, this one single server. So that's pretty okay. But here's one thing that you really need to take into account if you want to use this. You must never reuse the keys and the noise. So this S and the E and the S prime, E prime, E double prime. Um, in Diffie-Hellman, in the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman or classical Diffie-Hellman, there is this um, well optimization that you reuse keys for some time, like for an hour or two or something like that. Um, the Microsoft S channel library does that. Ne never do this here. That will immediately completely break security of this. I got a question from someone whether it would be okay to reuse it exactly once. So, and maybe that's okay, but I haven't looked at it. It's, it doesn't feel good. Probably it's not so bad. But don't reuse keys and noise. Okay. Now, as I said before, I've been working in my PhD thesis mainly on really high-speed crypto and crypto implementations. So I should tell you how fast this is. And, um, so in these like two or three days that we were working in Nijmegen over beers and a you know, productive environment, um, one thing that we said pretty much at the beginning is, let's choose parameters such that we can use the fast negacyclic number theoretic transform. Okay, what's that about? So this entity, well, essentially it gives you an extremely efficient multiplication algorithm in this ring, in this polynomial ring. So you saw before that we need to compute this AS and this AS prime, and then there's later a BS, a BS in there, um, and all these multiplications are actually the arithmetically hard part in this whole key exchange. And well, this entity-based multiplication, um, what you need for this to be well really efficient, and that is that um, two n divides q minus one, and we wanted q to be prime, and um, so that is the smallest prime. So this q, this um, one to two eight nine is the smallest prime such that q minus one, uh, that two n divides q minus one. So two n is two to the 11, and then um, one to two eight eight is two to the 13 plus two to the 12. And that's, that is the reason that we chose this q. And then what you do is if you have two polynomials f and g in this ring, then you transform them through this entity, this, well, sort of Fourier transform. You get an f hat and a g hat, and then you this f and g at each have 1024 coefficients again, so it's just a sort of in-place transformation. And um, then you multiply them component-wise, so just multiply each coefficient by the coefficient of the, of the other one. And then you get r hat, and this should have a hat here, this r, sorry. Um, so in the end, you just take whatever you get out of this point-wise multiplication and you transform through the inverse entity. And the entity, is extremely fast. It's um, doing these butterfly operations, and in the end, it runs an n log n. So you have this n log n transformation, another n log n transformation, so a quasi linear time multiplications. And then um, you do this point wise or component wise multiplications, so you do one inverse entity. That's all super fast. So that's what we started with. And then we went a bit further. So we said, you know, um, if we send polynomials in this entity domain, we can save a few of these transformations. 
because we don't transform back on one side and then receive it and then transform again to entity domain on the other side. So essentially by um, sending polynomials in entity domain, we are eliminating two of the entities. Yeah, and then we implemented that in C and somehow when writing it in C, we had this idea this should be really portable also to embedded devices. So only use 16-bit and 32-bit integer arithmetic, um, except for, for Ketchak. So this shake is inherently 64-bit arithmetic. So we le left the implementation as it was. And there's no division operations in there. There's no modular operation in there. Um, we're using something called Montgomery reduction inside the entity. That's also a new trick that we proposed in the paper. Um, for noise sampling, uh, we use the ChaCha20 stream cipher. We just sample some seed and then run ChaCha20 over it. Um, and then we said, let's make this really fast. So we took AVX2 vector instructions on recent Intel CPUs um, and vectorized pretty much everything. So speeding up the entity. Um, we used AES256 for noise sampling. That's a local decision. It doesn't matter um, the noise polynomials. They, they're just really local things. Um, so one side can use ChaCha20. The other one can use AES256. And then well, all this um, centered binomial that's vectorized the uh, um, reconciliation information, all this, this is all vectorized. So if you do that, then that's what the protocol revisited looks like. You get these entities being explicit here. So this uh, E hat that's being sent here is an entity domain. Um, you get actual exact statements on how large the messages are. It's 1824 bytes in one way. So a little bit less than two kilobytes. Here we get two kilobytes in this way because the reconciliation information is a bit larger than the seed. Um, and you can count that you, you do like one, two entities here and the inverse entity here. You do one, two, three entities here. Well, two entities, one inverse entity. And then a little bit of additional stuff. And that's how fast it is. So ECNS proposal for key generation was something like two and a half million cycles. We're down to 88,000. Um, then what the client computes um, after receiving the message, that's a little bit less than 4 million cycles here. We are at a little bit above 100,000. Um, and then the shared key computation um, is, well, slightly below 500,000, and we are slightly below 20,000. That's the speed up we get. You could say they also had a C implementation, so maybe we should compare with those numbers, but that's still, like, at least here and here, that's an order of magnitude faster. Um, also, what we include in these numbers is this a sampling of A at the beginning, which costs something something around 40,000 cycles. So I think it's 37,000 cycles here and 40,000 cycles, 43,000 cycles here. Um, so if you're really, really concerned on the server side about speed, you just cache that for a while and you can eliminate another 37,000 cycles on the server. Um, interesting thing is that's faster than ECC. It's faster than what we're currently using if you're really, really concerned about speed. Even if you lose, use the latest state-of-the-art elliptic curve cryptography in TLS, that would be, um, well, curve 25519 or x25519 key exchange, that's faster. So if you combine this, then from the computation speed, you lose less than a factor of two. That's pretty cool, actually. Um, then together with, uh, with Erdem and with a master student of mine, Phil Jakubait, um, we implemented that uh, on um, embedded microcontrollers, so the Cortex M0 and M4. And um, we started with the C implementation and then also really implemented everything all the way down in assembly, really optimized seriously at the entity. So the two of them did great work there. I didn't actually write much code of that assembly. Um, and yeah, so basically uh, all the building blocks are in the end optimized in assembly. And that's the speed we get on embedded microcontrollers. So that's of course much slower. So we get 4.5 million on an M0 and 4.75 million on the client side on an M0. But if you compare that to elliptic curve cryptography, um, you get something like 3.6 million, oh, that should have a million here, million cycles for, um, for X25519. And if you do real ephemeral key exchange and don't cache keys, you need to do two of those for, for a key exchange. So again, we're much, much faster than elliptic curve cryptography. Um, also, if you compare to hyperelliptic curve cryptography, very latest stuff, we are going to present this um, in two weeks at Chess in Santa Barbara. Um, that's on a Kuma surface, pretty crazy. It will also be broken by a quantum computer. Um, but also, it's also slower. OK. So now the interesting question after I've advertised all of this, I hope I did a good job at advertising New Hope. Um, the question is, should you be using it? And I mean, I've also said that you know, I'm not really confident in the level of cryptanalysis that has happened in this area. So yes, you should be using New Hope. Um, if you 
run some crypto that needs e post-quantum ephemeral key exchange now. It's my honest recommendation. Um, if you have any crypto protocol that where you're concerned about the security of your users still against an attacker that may revisit messages in 15 or 20 years, um, you should be using New Hope at the moment because there is, as far as I know, as far as I think, nothing better out there. However, you should always combine that with um, an elliptic curve key exchange so that you're definitely not doing worse than what you're doing at the moment in terms of security. So essentially that means that you're running both key exchanges and then you extract the final key from the shared keys of, of the two shared keys that you obtain. Easy thing is you can concatenate and hash. You may need to be a bit careful if you're combining that with authentication, um, but in principle that, that's what's happening. Um, also, if you do this, really make sure that you can easily upgrade to something better. I would estimate that in two years there will be something better than New Hope, and then you probably want to upgrade. I'm actually expecting something similarly secure, um, which is faster and has slightly shorter messages. That's actually, I'm relatively confident that we will have that. Or all the stuff will be broken, and then you also want to upgrade. Um, there are people using it, and that's, that's actually really awesome. So Google is at the moment running um, an experiment, a post-quantum experiment. Um, they integrated it into Boring SSL, and they're using it for some TLS connections. And they're using exactly the combination of, um, of New Hope with X25519 that I had on the, advertised on the previous slide. And they call it CECPQ1. Um, and they only do that for very few connections. So they use this from Chrome Canary. So as far as I understand, I can't even use that under Linux um, to some Google services that probably I don't use anyway. But you know, some people will be using it. And what they want to see is mainly whether these larger messages, um, so having two kilobytes instead of 32 bytes in the, in the key exchange, whether they cause trouble anywhere in the infra internet infrastructure. And um, they're not doing this for all key exchanges because they want to have um, a comparison to, well, traditional ones. And if you want to know more about this, there is a, a blog post in the security blog by Google. There's also, um, have, we've had some discussion about using New Hope for Tor. Um, so together with ISIS, um, I wrote up a proposal um, called Rebel Alliance that's essentially also doing New Hope and X25F19. So that's also the thing that is currently being used in Tor, in mTOR, in the mTOR handshake. Um, so we wrote this up, and there is a similar proposal which is doing Entru, so another lattice-based scheme, um, also for Tor, also combined with X25F19. That's by um, John Skank, William White, and Jen Fei Zhang. And they actually wrote this up in a much, much more scientific way with proper security analysis, security proofs, and everything. And that was published at PATS. Um, so a very nice paper. And if you want to know a bit more about how you need to be careful about combining things with authentication, that's a very nice paper to look at. And the idea is currently to merge these two proposals into work, such that you have like an infrastructure where you can plug in anything, which pretty much this paper already does. We need to, there's a few details that we need to look at, but I discussed with John. It's probably not so much of an, uh, of an issue. Okay, some future directions. Um, so after we implemented all of this and looked at it for a while, um, there were some thoughts that when we do this reconciliation, so we have some noisy data um, that we want to extract the same information from, probably we can learn something from people doing coding theory. And maybe there's some even better ways to do this than what we're doing at the moment. Um, we could actually get rid of this idea that we're sending uh, polynomials in entity domain. The advantage is that then the protocol is decoupled from um, the way that the multiplication is being computed. And then we could possibly also drop a few least significant bits, make the messages a little bit shorter. We discussed this back and forth and in the end decided not to do it. But if you change some other parameters, maybe it suddenly makes sense. Um, we could use a smaller queue, which is nice because messages become shorter. Um, we get higher security, as I explained earlier. Uh, but then we can't do this negacyclic NTT thing anymore because that is already the smallest queue that supports this, this negacyclic NTT. So there's some trade-offs there. Um, maybe we can use Nussbaumer's multiplication algorithm. It's also some FFT-based thing, but it's, it can handle um, a more general queue. And uh, currently a student of mine has been looking into this, and uh, his optimized implementation looks very promising. Um, could also use Karatsuba and Tomb, so non-FFT-based methods for multiplication. Um, might, might be good, at least if you make n somewhat smaller. And that's also something where, while we're using a power of two for n because we need this for the entity, um, 
but it feels like this is really, really, really secure. So maybe if we can go for something like n equals 800, we'd still have a serious security margin, but make messages a bit smaller and everything a bit more, more comfortable. Some other things I, that I find interesting, so this is not authenticated at all, so you need some authentication around this. Either you put signatures on top, or you use a pre-quantum static Diffie-Hellman authentication, which at the moment is just fine, but then once there are quantum computers, we need something else. Um, there's a paper by uh, Zhang, Zhang, Ding, Snook, and Dardelan from 2015. That's about 100 times slower than you hope for authenticated key exchange, but also that's not an optimized implementation. So they say it's a proof of concept implementation. So I would assume the implementation can be improved, but maybe you can also change parameters there, apply a few more tricks, maybe ap apply this trick of not using Gaussian noise, but um, the central binomial. It's definitely some things that you can, can do about it. Then there was recently a proposal um, called Frodo, um, by a lot of authors, so um, Vos Costello, um, Nerik were involved in Sibila, also, also the BCNF people, and then uh, Leo Jika was involved in Mironov and uh, Nikolenko and uh, Raghunathan. Um, and they do the thing without this additional structure in the matrix. So they're doing LWE-based things, so somewhat more conservative, maybe. Um, also, larger messages, slower, but it's definitely an interesting, interesting proposal. Um, Maybe we could do Entru-based key exchange. So Entru is designed as an encryption scheme, but you can use it for key exchange. Um, well, basically, that's what the, the Entru Tor proposal does. Um, so if you do that for the purely ephemeral key exchange, it looks worse than what we're doing with Ring LWE, and most people agree that it feels worse, um, security-wise, performance-wise, in various ways. Um, but maybe if we do authenticated key exchange, it, it's, it gets better, or you can tweak something there. So certainly something I would like to look at. And then there's another proposal that recently uh, came up that's by Bernstein, uh, Jung Sachansap, Lange, and von Bredendahl. Um, that's Entru Prime, that's a, a variant of Entru, um, which I don't really think it's useful for ephemeral key exchange, so it's also using, it's aiming at encryption. Uh, so it's choosing parameters in a way that I would say doesn't really make sense for ephemeral key exchange, but maybe we can also use it, or maybe it can be tweaked or modified, um, and maybe there's also something to learn from it. So there's, it's a very active field, and I think so maybe it gives you some ideas why I believe that in two years we will have something better. Um, if you'd like to know more about this, um, there's a paper online, the New Hope paper, at cryptojedi.org slash paper slash hash New Hope. Um, there's the software online at slash crypto slash hash New Hope. The ARM paper is online at hash New Hope ARM. ARM software is in its own Git repository. Um, and then several other people um, took the C code and ported it to other programming languages. So uh, Yawning uh, ported it to, uh, to Go and ISIS ported it to Rust, and uh, Riz uh, wrote me email two or three days ago and ported it to Java, and then today on Twitter I learned that there's an Erlang implementation of New Hope. I found this extremely cool, so I think that's a good thing to put at the end of my talk, so thank you for your attention. Very, very nice question. Um, so it is protected against timing attacks, inherently protected. I would assume that if you do power analysis, yes, but you will have a really, really hard time because it's an ephemeral exchange. So everything is used just once. Every secret is used really just once. So you can get exactly one trace for one secret. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible to attack, but it, it, I would really want to see it. it, it so. No, it's not protected against power or EM attacks or noise attack. Well, noise probably, as far as I know, yes. Tricky. Um, definitely against timing attacks, and that's what we were most worried about because those are the attacks that you can do remotely. Any other questions? Uh, let, let me go back to the protocol, um, some version of the protocol as I had it here. Um, and then I'll see whether I understand your question correctly. So um, in lattice-based crypto, it is a common pattern that you generate some noise and you, you compute something. 
the communication pattern, if that's maybe what you're aiming at, is different from Diffie-Hellman. Um, in Diffie-Hellman, what you can do is that um, every participant generates a secret, computes a public thing, completely independently, and then afterwards we just send those over. So in this case here, that doesn't work um, because this party here needs to receive um, the value from Alice first before being able to compute the reconciliation information. So you get a different um, communication pattern there. You get this dependency in the messages. And this is something that, yes, lattice-based key exchange always has and that all protocols have. And yeah, if you can get rid of this, um, I would owe you many, many beers. It would be really cool to have. Actually, many protocols, I think, would be really happy to have like this traditional Diffie-Hellman communication pattern. And you would, would get this if you didn't need the reconciliation information, which is why I drew these pictures for several days until I convinced myself that we really need it. Yeah. Um, oh, we basically tweaked it until we got the same failure probability. And then um, if you have shorter polynomials and then if you multiply them and, and then the noise doesn't grow that much in the, um, in, inside the multiplication because the polynomials have fewer coefficients. And then the worst case noise that you get, or it doesn't get that large. Um, so you can make the noise per coefficient a slightly bit larger and still get the same failure probability. But we also had discussions about that, whether we should keep the same K or whether we should have the same failure probability or what we would want. And actually what we tried to do there is to say, okay, if we really went for N equals 512, could we get to the security level that we're aiming at? And probably um, we could have done this by just being less conservative in our security analysis. We could have easily argued that um, Jar Jar has 140 bits of security post quantum. If you just take a few constants in there that we gave the attacker for free very easily. Um, definitely 128, 130, yeah. Are all Say again? Are all A's equal in security? That's an interesting question. I mean, if you choose A equals zero, right, then you get like uh, weird corner cases. But, um, what we need is essentially that the, uh, the, the Shake 128 expansion um, works as a random oracle. And then the probability to run in like really weird corner cases is negligible. And otherwise, there's, if you know a hidden structure in the matrix, or if the matrix has some obvious structure, which is not, like, obviously not uniform anymore, then there may be attacks that can exploit this. But if you have a matrix and you look at it and it, it looks like uniformly random and you can't distinguish it from uniformly random, then as far as I know, there's nothing that you can, that you can do except if you have a hidden structure in it, which you can't embed through, through shake. Also, um, the participants wouldn't be have any interest in embedding uh, a hidden structure in there, yeah. which is different from some entity choosing it in advance and then everybody using it. Um, the, the slides I will definitely put online. I assume the, the video is on YouTube later. It has been streamed. Yeah, so yes. Um, CryptoJedi.org. Then scroll down to talks. We'll be there. Yeah. Because cool. I'm kind of a really new to all of this and curious to learn how people even go about doing uh, the post-quantum security analysis that I do this on, like the two algorithms that you showed in the beginning of the talk. Yeah. And why should I trust that this is true? Um, so I must say that, so this algorithm is BKZ algorithm, if I wanted to really understand the algorithm, I would have to sit down and implement it. And I've never done this, so I don't, I don't understand the algorithm. So I trust Leo on that. He actually, I think, did implement some bits of it, or the whole thing, yeah. Is it running this on quantum computers today, or is it just... Oh, there's a building block inside that you're using on, on quantum... Well, obviously, we're not running it on quantum computers today. We don't have quantum computers. Um, but you can use BKZ, um, where inside the building block, where we use the quantum sieve, for the SCP, you can use a different oracle, so a pre-quantum oracle. And that is slightly less efficient, but you can essentially use the same structure of the algorithm just with a different sort of black box oracle thing that you plug in there, which is pre-quantum. Yeah? So, uh, traffic analysis. 
analysis. Um, if I'm the NSA and I'm watching this, and I is there is there any structure to the um, the seed or the entity domain um, polynomials? So you. Um, so that would be interesting. Well, for the NSA, they want to break into it, right? But maybe if you're running the Chinese firewall and you want to know whether somebody's doing a key exchange, yes, you can see that. So you see essentially these two kilobytes going over the channel where the polynomial part of this, all the coefficients are between zero and Q. Or, well, zero and Q minus one, including Q minus one. And yeah, that, that you can immediately see. So you don't have anything like for elliptic curves, the alligator map. Um, you can do this. And we've also been discussing some thought, something along those lines. The obvious way to do this is if you choose a Q a power of two. And then you get something which you can't, you can't distinguish each coefficient from being, being uniformly random. It's between zero and two to the, well, two to the whatever, two to the W minus one. And then you get essentially uniform noise. And then you wouldn't be, but choosing Q as a power of two has implication, other implications for security. And then some lattice cryptographers say, yeah, it doesn't really matter. And some others say, yeah, it doesn't really feel good. And that's exactly this point where cryptanalysis is not that well understood. So what happens, for example, if you choose Q a power of two? What? You can get pretty different answers from different people if you ask this. I've, I've asked a few people. There's other ways to, to obtain this, by the way. Um, but that is not as, uh, as free as choosing Q a power of two. More questions? All right. Okay.